You watch YouTube artists all the time. You watch while their processes emerge on the screen, right in front of your eyes. But have you ever wondered what really drives them? Why are they compelled to scrawl or splash those images on the paper or the canvas or even the wall? Why do they do it? I've been trying to figure that out for myself lately. Why do I do it? There are days when I'm just desperate to put paint and ink on the paper and something that I can't quite see out of the corner of my mind is shimmering like a mirage. I want to get closer. I want to see it. I want to capture it and reveal it to myself and to you in the watery pigment awaiting release from the tip of my brush. But the more ardently I pursue this vision, the more elusive it becomes. At that point, I have to give up, not really give up, but relax out of that proverbial finger trap. It's not surrender to failure at all. If making meaningful art is out of reach, why not drop back and punt? Time for skill building, which is a much better use of time than brooding over a romanticized, unattainable vision that just isn't there. What's the worst that can happen? The mechanical aspects of art become second nature? Isn't that a good thing? Because then when the vision is right there at the forefront, ripe to be plucked out of imagination and rendered, the skills are there to externalize it and make it visible to the naked eye. I don't have any more to offer on this subject. I guess the answer to why artists wrestle with their vision, bearing down until it is finally birthed onto their preferred surface, is still a mystery. I suppose it's safe to say that, for whatever reason, they just have to do it. Now we'll get into a more personal aspect of this video, which some people like. Yeah, we had a storm at the end of April and it took out quite a bit of our fence, but our fence was really, really old and we were hoping to limp along one more year, um, but we had to replace it. So we replaced it and then about a week later we had another storm and our backyard neighbor's tree fell into our yard. But fortunately this time it only took out one section of the fence. We have kind of a, a neighborhood tree and lawn person. The neighborhood doesn't provide any of that stuff. It's just that he works in our area and he's done stuff for so many of the neighbors that we kind of, I don't know, everyone seems to call him. Anyway, his crew was going to come out and take the tree, cut it up and, and remove it out of our yard the week before Mother's Day, but it kept raining. So, you know, what a nice group of people. They came out on Sunday on Mother's Day and they cut that thing up and hauled it out, which was pretty awesome. And um, so I'm very happy to have gotten that out of the way. We're still waiting for the fence company to come and replace that section. We were going to do it ourselves, but all of the lumber at the big box stores near us, the pickets are not the same size. So it would obviously not match. And the, the fence guys are so busy now that, I mean, what it cost $300 to replace that section, maybe, maybe $500. Um, <laughs> if it's really inconvenient for them and we really want them to do it. Um, but, you know, the, the other jobs they have are really big jobs. So I'm sure we're going to be without that little section of fence for a while. So um, I'm half upset and half just really thankful that 
It didn't hit her house or our house. Nobody's car got mashed. Um, and our, the crew came and took care of the tree as quickly as they could. So I'm just going to put it down to that and hope that <laughs> we get the rest of our fence fixed pretty soon. I mean, it's just a, it's a nuisance. It's not really, we don't, I can't let my cat out because he's going to make a beeline for that opening in the fence. Um, and I had all these kind of romantic ideas about going out there this spring and doing art and having the cat out there with me. And well, that's clearly not going to happen now. <laughs> but I don't know. It's all right. It's okay. Yeah, and you're probably going, well, why don't you, you don't have to take the cat out there with you. You do not know my cat. He is the most persistent, very vocal cat. He will sit in the window and he will cry because somebody is out in, out in the backyard and he's not out there with them. He has a fit. And all I can say is it's a good thing he's so soft and fluffy and pretty because that cat is on my last nerve today. Well, actually, he's been pretty good today. <laughs> but he can be, he's, a, he's kind of a handful. And he's getting old. He's like, I think he's like nine years old. When we took him to the vet, she thought he was a lot younger. And um, so he's had a very posh life, this cat. Okay, now I'm going to talk about this piece of art. It started out as a neurographic piece. I just wanted to doodle on it. I, um, I got some new pen nibs and I wanted to play with those and see what I could do with them. And then all this weird stuff just kept happening, you know, in May. And there's more, but it's not all my story to tell. So I don't really feel like I want to share it because it involves a, a family member who, let's just say there was a, um, a medical event that ended up not being that serious, but could have been. Anyway, um, <laughs> on Mother's Day. So it's just been such a weird, weird month. And uh, May always seems to bring in the winds of change and the winds of weird, anomalous stuff. So I guess that's what affected this drawing. Um, I started to look to just see what did I see in this, in the structure of the neurographic drawing. And um, I saw some eyes and a face and I saw a teddy bear. Somebody else said they saw feet. They, you did see feet if you and I are in agreement, but my, the feet I saw were just attached to a teddy bear. And I think because it was approaching Mother's Day while I was working on this, so I had those kind of things on my mind. You know, remembering when the kids were little and stuff they did. And, um, well, I'm going to tell on myself, I don't ever, I don't like to receive gifts because um, there's this pressure to, like what you get and I also feel like there's the pressure on the gift giver to make sure they give the exact correct gift and I don't like to do that to anybody <laughs> and I don't I don't want to feel like you know because like especially for a husband and a wife you guys sh your money is kind of pooled so there's there's a finite amount of money for gifts and if you have to wait to get a gift and then when you get it, you don't like it, you, you've, the money's been spent regardless of who purchased it. The money's gone. And if you say you don't like it, then the person who gave it to you feels bad and you didn't get what you wanted. <laughs> I guess I'm a little bit. I'm very pragmatic. I mean, about this, even when my husband and I were dating, I did not um, 
I, I wasn't one of those fiancés who wanted the great story, like um, be, waiting for f- five years to get proposed to and you get what, you know, they go and they get a ring and then there's a, like this big ceremony. Most of the marriages that I know that happen like that are not necessarily all that happy. I think it works a whole lot better when everyone just says what they want and we don't expect the other person to read our minds. And no, you know, there there is no good end to that. If you want whatever you need or want out of your relationship, you need to be clear about it. And I at least that's my opinion. I can never be in a kind of relationship where, um, you know, if he doesn't know what I want automatically, then he must not love me. I never, I don't feel that way. It's like, dude, I want some art supplies. Can I get them? Do you mind if I get them? And call it a Mother's Day present. (laughs) And he's like, yeah, go for it. Everybody's happy. Nobody has to hunt for anything. Nobody has to hide anything. Nobody has to, um, pretend that they like something that they got and they didn't like it. You know what I mean? I'm probably going over this over and over again, but yeah. So I bought myself a few Mother's Day presents, I guess is the point of this whole long story. So there's an art store It's the only art store in the suburbs, and it has been part of the community for decades and decades and decades. I want to say probably 60 or 70 years. Um, Keith Coltsnose was around when I, when my family first moved to this area, and then it became Creative Cold Snow. But I mean, when I was in high school, and the first the first time I went to college, um, yeah, Cold Snows was where you got everything, all your art supplies, everything. And they had, um, they even had like art lessons that they, and, and even up until about the last couple of months, Cold Snows also had um, figure drawing. They had nude figure drawing down on in their plaza um, art store. But I don't know. Things have just changed since 2000. I mean, a lot of online shopping and these mom and pop stores just have a hard time competing with Amazon. And I'll, I'll admit, I hate to admit it, but a lot of times I would go to the store and they didn't have it in stock and they'd say, well, we can order it for you. And it would take like two weeks and it would also cost about 30 or 40 percent more. People are just not going to do that. And um, they're, they went out of business. I think this is their final week. Um, and I, we went out there a couple of times to get stuff. And it was, it was very sad for me because it's like, I don't know, all these little things from the past are just going away bit by bit. And um, one of the people, I'm sure she's like a part owner or something. She's been there forever too. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Other people were asking her. I I didn't really ask. I just listened. Um, So, well, what are you going to do now um, with your time? And you could tell it was just a sad time. It's, it's a sad, it's like the end of an era. So, um, I got a few items there. Uh, I'm struggling to try and say exactly, uh, what I feel about it because I, there are so many conflicting emotions about it. It's like, um, it's not working, so you need to move on and, and find an endeavor that is going to work. But at the same time, I've had, I have started over in my life 
for a career many times, like probably five times. That's a lot for most people. But I remember even being in elementary school, like fourth grade or fifth grade in social studies. They were they told us then the days your parents and your grandparents may have worked for the same company their whole lives, but your generation won't. You will have to, um, technology is going to advance quickly enough that you're going to have to you're going to have to find new career, several new careers in your lifetime. So I was kind of already prepared for that growing up. Um, and I, it never occurred to me that I was going to work for the same company my whole life. Um, but to see aspects of your community just kind of go away, it's weird. And um, um, I've lived here since I was six, seven years old in this area with a brief stint when I moved to my husband's town briefly, but um, I convinced him to come here. <laughs> I don't think he's ever really regretted it because we both worked over here. But um, yeah, society's just changing. So a lot of that ended up in this neurographic drawing, uh, painting a little bit. Um, you know how time passes you by a little bit. You know, things change. So this neurographic drawing isn't my usual fare for this um, channel. It's actually not my usual fare at all. But recently, uh, I know I talked about it in the last video or two, that uh, I'm not going to try and, and make sure I produce a video every week or two weeks or whatever. Because um, I really, I'm kind of at a plateau in my skill set where um, I want to do more ambitious things, but I just, I don't have skills yet. So uh, I'm doing a lot of work in my sketchbook. And I got to tell you, there is, there's an artist that um, I don't know. Listen, you guys, I don't know anyone. So if I mention anyone's name, I don't know them at all. But um there's an artist whose work isn't anything like mine at all, and um, he makes his own sketchbooks, and he's also done a few tutorials. There, and tutorials aren't even his thing, but um, about getting really fine, even washes. I love it. If you want to check out his channel, um, it's Scott Teplin, and I have known how to chase the bead but I was always taught you want to only have two or three layers because if you put more than that you're going to overwork the paper and he demonstrated he sometimes he has 10 15 layers of wash on and that they're so even they're so beautifully flat and even so I've been really honestly drilling myself on that just making a clean even wash this blue here underneath the underneath the um, teddy bear that's thalo turquoise and you know thalo's stain terribly and um, they can be really temperamental bullies and I was able to get a nice, nice clean wash. Um, now the the other blue, that is PB60. It's indenthrone blue, um, anthraquinone blue, depending on what brand. I've tried it in three different brands, and supposedly it doesn't granulate. I do not like this color. I mean, I don't like the pigment. I like the color. I don't like it. I cannot get. A clean nice even wash to save my life it um, it lifts up too easily so even if you put on a really thin layer it comes back up with the next wash so uh, I probably will not use that again I did some experimenting and if I put down a layer of magenta underneath it and then put uh, the next layers of Thalo Blue, they have a more um, middle blue tone. 
so you can get that middle blue not greenish you know phthalo blue tends to lean toward the green a little bit you can get rid of that and so you know i know it's kind of boring but drills drills i just can't get to the next level until i up my skills so that's what i've been working on and um and it is it can be really meditative too there's nothing wrong with up, upping your skills um i would rather i have to say i think what really separates a true artist from i mean you know the 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 really brilliant um da vinci's and um Picasso's and those people they have they see things in a different way and they're able to render it and if you can't do that um, if you if you don't have that vision I don't think you're ever going to be in the history books as one of the major artists you have to have something that you have to bring something that nobody else has ever seen that being said all of them were great technical artists as well. They had the skills. So if I had to be somebody who um, had the vision and could see things but couldn't render it, I would find that to, I find that to be very frustrating when I have a vision and I can't render it. Um, but sometimes I don't even have a vision. But I, I think I still would rather be a competent technical artist than be a visionary who can't communicate. So I'm gonna to continue to do um, the grunt work of working on skills. I think it's fine to do that. And um, so that's what's, <laughs> I'm answering my own question that I said I didn't have an answer for. I sort of do, I think it changes. You know, if you have that vision, then that's what drives you. Sometimes you don't have a, di a, a vision, but you just, man, you just want to work with your hands. You just want to do something. Um, you want to make, I, I like, I honestly, I like to just render color. That turns me on. I love it. And then, of course, uh, just the content of this particular painting. The inspiration came from a guy on Instagram named Chris Hicks. So if you're on Instagram, go take a look at his work. He is known as uh, Not So Perfect Lines. And every month he does a spread in his notebook. And it's just, I think it's just on notebook paper. And it's the whole month, every day of the month, something happened, his thoughts, and he draws it and doodles in it. And it's really cool. So that was the inspiration for the content as I was working on my skills. So shout out to Chris. Thanks a lot, Chris. And go take a look at his work. And then speaking of rambling and, and going around in circles, I want to show you something that I got at Cold Snows. Well, and I called it a, um, a Mother's Day present. I don't know a lot about chalk pastels, but I got to use them in um, a class last summer and I want to learn a little more about it and they had so many chalk pastels left that I just bought a bunch. I saw a, um, a documentary on the handmade pastels that were used by Rembrandt I think. Let me check. Okay, the pastels that I saw the documentary about uh, were La Maison du Pastel by Henri Roche. You guys, I don't speak a lick of French. That's my best, that's the best rendition I can do. But um, they're the original pastels. Um, they're handmade. And they're just outrageously expensive. But um, I happened to just, because I was interested in the, the media, just 
it's kind of a cool thing the way they hand make these pastels. So um, I went on the hunt just to see what other pastels were handmade. And these unison uh, soft pastels are handmade and they happen to have a bunch of them at Cold Snows. So I picked up some random colors. And like I said, I don't know anything about these except what I've seen in the documentaries, which is, you know, I was doing other stuff while I was watching it. So <laughs> uh, the retention of what I l learned or heard is a little bit sketchy. There was also a, a set of four pastels by Rembrandt. And I think it had originally been, I think I got it for something ridiculous, like $7 for the, the little set. So I picked that up too. Anyway, someday, <laughs> maybe I'll do something with that on YouTube. We'll see. So I did some of my art supplies. I've seen other artists do that and I never draw my art supplies. And it seems like such a, a really basic thing to do so I thought I would give it a try and they're more of a sketch that it's not like a huge study it was getting long in the production of this video and you know I can only make you guys wait so long and it really wasn't about anything other than just having a lot of weird stuff going on but um yeah I enjoyed drawing my art supplies I'm going to do that more um, the other thing is, I can't believe I didn't draw the pastels. I don't know why I didn't think to, but I didn't. Um, and just did some more doodles in here and painted those. And um, I had a lot of fun mixing the colors and doing those, those washes. And um, so anyway, let me know if there's anything you guys would like to see me explore on camera. Um, and if I have any capacity to do it, I'll try it out. Okay. And, um, I don't know. That's all I've got to say about this painting. I think I've got about three minutes left on this video and I want to say, wow. The other thing that happened in May is I hit 2,500 subscribers and I think that that's awesome. I really want to say thank you. If any of you have shared my videos, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden there was this big uptick. So if you happen to have uh, shared my videos with anyone and it helped it take off a little bit, I really appreciate that very much. And um, I also want to say thanks for all the nice comments that you guys leave. I really enjoy reading them. Um, and I'd also like to know what you guys are up to, too. So, at any rate, that's about all I have for you guys today. And um, take care. Be safe. Happy creating, okay, you guys? See you soon. Smooches. Bye.